Uh, brothers and sisters, up to the last session, we've gone, th- we've gone over how the Israelites crossed the Jordan and reached the threshold of the city of Jericho. The flow of the overflowing Jordan River stopped by God's almighty power, and all of them crossed it as if they were walking through dry land, experiencing the work of God who was with them, boosted their morale all the more, while the Canaanites trembled in fear. At the time, God commanded them to do something special, which was circumcision, and through that circumcision, God notifies us that we have to circumcise ourselves and cleanse ourselves so that we can win the spiritual battle. That process was... They gone through such process. They walked through the dry land of Jordan and they were right before Jericho. But to perfectly take possession of Canaan, they still had, had a lot to go through. The next obstacle, the city of Jericho, was even more difficult to overcome. The two-layer wall of Jericho was thick enough for chariots to run on it. Also, heavily armed soldiers were standing guard. There was absolutely no way for the Israelites to conquer the city on their own. But God had already decided that He would give victory to Israel in this battle. God said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with this king and the valiant warriors. And for them to win battle, God commanded circumcision, and even in that dangerous situation, the Israelites, without involving fleshly thoughts, obeyed and circumcised themselves. And God presented detailed strategies for victory. As we explore how God led Israel to victory, I hope all of you get life and strength out of this message in its entirety. As you listen to this message, just don't think, I received a lot, I received a lot of grace. Don't just feel that you are watching a movie. You know, the, what I'm speaking is based on what Sina Pastor is based on Sina Pastor's sermon. You remember vividly how Sina Pastor preached about it. And also, at the end of the sermon, he, there was like a preview of the next session. Because this is based on St. Pastor's message. You know, we are just joyfully looking, taking a look at the journey of Canaan. But just receive grace and that's it. It's no use. God stopped the flow of the Jordan. God who did that is your father. Then when you face trouble, you have to rely on this God. But if you just listen to the message and, and that's it, and don't rely on God, but just involve your own fleshly thoughts, that doesn't mean you receive, truly received grace. Once you receive grace, in face of hardships or trouble, you have to stop complaining and involving fleshly thoughts and repent of it. You have to ask God to give you spiritual faith so that you can overcome any situation. You have to pile up prayer. Just receiving grace during the service is not everything. Just praying for one week or two is not everything. You have to hold on to the grace and pray with it day after day. Then all the concerns and worries will be gone. While you pray, you don't have worries or concerns. But in our life, in our life, we find ourselves not living as just as we prayed. That's why we have to pray continually without ceasing. every night. As you do so, you can be victorious and overcome your troubles. You have to be, you have to challenge yourself like this. Only then can you make life and strength out of this message. That's why I'm delivering delivering you this message. So, I hope that you can overcome You will have all your problems resolved by God's power, win all your spiritual battles, and give glory to God. Brothers and sisters, as already explained, 
the city of Jericho was so sturdy and had a double-layered wall, so it was extremely difficult to attack it. Nowadays, we could just blow it up with the use of artillery, but at the time, things like gunpowder hadn't been even invented yet. But God directly notified them of how to destroy Jericho. He told all the soldiers and the people to march around the city once a day for six days and seven times on the seventh day. What kind of strategy was that? Then, they marched around the city for seven days. Then, how many times did they march around it? They marched once a day for six days, and on the seventh day, they marched around it seven times from the dawning of the day, so they did 13 times in total. We were... Before we were taught by Sina Pastor, I mean, they, for six days, they marched around it once, and on the last day, they did it seven times. But it's not to say that number 13 has a spiritual meaning. But they are marching around Jericho for seven days, and they are marching around it seven times on the seventh day. have a meaning. Seven spiritually signifies perfection. So, it means that we have to wholly believe the word of God and obey just as we are told. Also, in the book of 2 Kings, Elijah told General Naaman that he would be cleansed if he dipped himself in the Jordan seven times. Because water signifies the word of God spiritually, dipping himself seven times signified perfect obedience to the Word of God. If you perfectly abide by God's Word, then with His work, you can have all your problems resolved. Brothers, while the Israelites marched around the city, the seven priests were in the front holding trumpets of ram's horns. They were followed by the people carrying the Ark of the Lord's Covenant. And God told them that they shall march around the city seven times on the seventh day. And when the priests make, made a long blast with the trumpets, they shall give a loud shout. Giving a loud shout matters. It signifies car- crying out in prayer. Before the exodus, as the people cried out to God in prayer, God listened to them. While they were living as slaves in Egypt, they cried out to God, to their God. And in answer to their prayer, God sent Moses to them and delivered them out of Egypt. In so many scenes of the Bible, the prophets or the Lord's disciples cried out in prayer. Most of all, even our Lord prayed to the point where His sweat turned into the drops of blood. When He In reviving Lazarus, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Even when he breathed his last, he cried with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Even on the cross, he cried with a loud voice, Father, please receive my spirit. God always emphasizes crying with a loud voice. The same way to the Israelites standing before the city, God told them to give a loud shout. While they marched around it for six days, they kept silent. But on the seventh day, after marching around this seven times, they shouted and they gave a long, loud shout. Even if they shouted loudly, how could the walls that didn't have ears crumble down? Did the walls uh, could hear what they said? It's not possible. How could the walls crumble down just by hearing the shouts from the people? That happened because they obeyed. That strategy was actually total nonsense from man's perspective, but Israel obeyed without any doubt. 
Only then could God work. Only then could you experience His work. He is the Almighty God, our Father, who accomplishes great things. But to bring down His power, we have to show perfect obedience and circumcise ourselves. The Israelites did so. After they received that command, I mean, the following day, the people of Jericho saw a really bizarre scene, really unusual. As the entire army of Israel rose and headed towards the city, they assumed they would soon attack them. Seeing this, they assumed that the Israel would attack them soon, and they put themselves on the highest alert. They braced themselves for a fight. They were getting prepared to fight. But what they did was just march around the city with the Ark of the Covenant once and return to their camp. On day two as well, all of them them came and without throwing a stone, without throwing a single stone, They only marched around and went back. On day 3, 4, 5, and 6 as well, the only thing they did was march around the city and go back. The people of Jericho absolutely had no idea why they did so. A surprising fact here is, even while the Israelites marched around their city, the soldiers of Jericho didn't even dare shoot a single arrow. they were silently marching around the city and the people in Jericho the soldiers in Jericho didn't shoot a single arrow didn't throw a single stone they didn't attack them they just they did nothing but watch them why why did they do so? the soldiers the people in Jericho heard rumors about the works of God and they had already been overcome by fear. They saw the Israelites coming towards the city and marching around it. They saw it as strange, but they were overcome by fear. They wondered, what are they doing? As they were consumed by fear, they couldn't do anything. It's because they heard about God's extraordinary works manifested by three Israelites. That's why they were afraid. They vividly remembered the splitting of the Red Sea, which happened 40 years earlier. And not long after, I mean, recently, they also watched the Jordan River stop flowing before their eyes. Being extremely nervous and anxious, they were just helpless. helpless, and couldn't do anything. In addition, Israel's strategy was quite unusual. It was something never heard of. Even while they were completely unarmed, they were boldly marching around with trumpets of ram's horns. As time went by, the people of Jericho became more afraid and couldn't dare attack them. Because God gave them fear, they got increasingly frightened by Israel's mysterious actions. They couldn't do anything but watch them. It was a little different on the seventh day. The Israelites came out earlier, marched around the city seven times, made a long blast with the trumpets, and gave a loud shout. Then, an absolutely incredible thing happened. Even with the attack from a big army, it would have been difficult to leave a hole on that double-layer wall, but it collapsed instantly. I want you to visualize this. I want you to picture what you saw in in a movie dealing with uh, battles of the ancient times. Uh, people, the gate to the city was not open easily, so people threw stones and they shoot arrows. They used various methods of attacks. 
to throw stones into the city, they had to use some apparatus. When they threw stones, even though they threw stones, the walls, the city didn't collapse at once. Just a part of the city was broken. So through that broken part, people came in and attacked. That's what... But how was it possible that such a thick wall, which was over two meters high, crumbled down in an instant without... even though they didn't lay their hands on it once? Such incredible works, which aren't to be found in any other war history, repeatedly took place with Israel, whom God was with. As the shouting of the people reverberated, the wall instantly turned into the heaps of stones with thunderous roars and dust covering the sky over the city, with loud screams from the rubble echoing throughout. Its soldiers ran away terrified and confused. While the city was in a state of complete chaos, it was so easy for the Israelites to take it over. Everyone, God is so great. But to bring down such work of the great God, we have to show perfect obedience. They com- God commanded them to march around the city. This is God's strategy. But unlike the first generation, if they were like just the first generation, they would have never obeyed. If you remember the message you've heard, you can guess how the first generation would have acted. They would have said like, just because we marched around it, would it crumble down? If God just makes it crumble down, then we can just go into it and attack Him. If they did so, they would never experience God's work. By the work of God, the city wall crumbled down. Such great work was possible by the power of God. And and it happened also by the perfect obedience shown by the Israelites. They were united in obeying the words of Joshua. They were in a critical situation. You know, they marched around the city involving fresh thoughts. This was such a Even so, they demonstrated the deeds of perfect obedience, thereby experiencing God's work. Also, we have to apply this in your own lives. You know, we find ourselves in a trouble on a personal, household, or national scale where we are completely helpless until we enter heaven, we face such moments because this world is under the control of the enemy devil. Because darkness hates light. If we live in the light, evil people who are controlled by Satan continually attack you. But as we live in the light, we also live in protection, but sometimes we may find ourselves in such troubles. On a personal level, on a national level, we may find ourselves helpless. In such a time as this, people with a strong will make utmost efforts to deal with it, but no matter how strong-willed and capable they are, they are helpless before problems that are beyond man's limits to resolve. After agonizing in unbearable distress, they fall into despair and just give up. People, just because people have knowledge and authority, they cannot solve all the problems. When they face a problem like the city of Jericho, we may find ourselves in such a situation, but the children of God who have faith have nothing to worry about, no matter the circumstance, because they believe that even what is impossible by man is possible by God's power. God, who created the heavens and the earth, split the Red Sea, delivered Israel out of Egypt, stopped the flow of the Jordan, and destroyed Jericho. 
the same way He can solve all our problems. The only thing we have to do is find out what God's will is and boldly act in faith. By faith, we can experience God's work, but we have to know how we can have faith, how we can have such a spiritual faith. I haven't explained. Just because you say, I believe, it doesn't happen. We have to do, there are things we have to do to have spiritual faith. No matter how long you live a Christian life, that doesn't mean you have spiritual life. Just because you say, I believe, that doesn't mean you can overcome problems like the city of Jericho. Even though you are told to rely on God, and even though you know that faith, with faith everything is possible, you have to realize what true faith is and strive to have such faith. Also, As for matters we can resolve on our own, we can get them done much easier if we get strengthened by God. So we have to commit all things, all affairs in our lives to God. The Bible says, some boast in chariots, some in horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. Namely, if we only rely on the Lord our God, and march in faith without involving worldly ways and knowledge, God will fight for us and always lead us to victory. Thus, no matter the problem, no matter the problem, we shouldn't rely on man, authority, knowledge, or worldly ways. As we rely only on God and pray, God will take responsibility, solve all our problems, and bless us. Such great God, such Almighty God, is our Father. I want you to rely on Him and live in His protection and be always victorious. Please remember this. God, suppose the first generation was told the same strategy from God. Would they have obeyed? And the secret For the second generation, as the Israelites took over Jericho, they didn't take any of the spoils from the city privately. They burned them or set them apart as sacrifices to offer to God. And they killed all the people and animals of the city, following God's command. hearing of God's command to destroy all things from the city, some people suspect that God is scary or cruel. Please don't be mistaken. God, when the Israelites were conquering the land, when they were having a battle, the first thing, first, God told them to try to make peace with them. If the enemies made peace, they didn't have a war. God didn't just tell them to annihilate them all. They told them to told them to uh, find a way to make make peace with them. But specifically, the Canaanites were commanded to be killed, and there was a spiritual reason. Without knowing the spiritual reason, we may misunderstand God. We may think of God as cruel. I'm sorry that I'm using that word cruel in referring to God. But that's how those people who don't believe or know God feel about Him. But there were just reasons for God to command it. The Israelites offering God the spoils of the city is the same as our offering the first income, the first fruit to God. Because the spoils were what they obtained first in the promised land, they first offer them to God. Usually, when they get the spoils from the war, they share it. But at the time, Because they were what they first obtained from the land, God commanded them. Also, it was essential that the people 
and the animals of the city be killed to preserve the holiness of Israel. The inhabitants of Canaan had been living a corrupt life with great iniquities, adulterously worshipping many idols. If they had been left alive to dwell with the Israelites, Israel would have been drenched in sins and evil and ended up in death. They would live in that land, and the inhabitants of Canaan were worshipping idols. As they lived together, they would have accepted their culture. We can confirm this as we look at the history. Even while Moses was with them, you know, when the Israelites were invited by the Gentiles to visit, they ended up, even though God prohibited them from worshiping idols, they were quick to be tempted. That's why so that they would not stain with the sins and evil by the Canaanites God commanded them to kill all the Canaanites this was the reason Moses exalted them you shall consume all the peoples whom the Lord your God will deliver to you your eyes shall not pity them not, nor shall you serve their gods for that would be a snare to you This was why Israel annihilated the citizens of Jericho. As for those who haven't learned the situation in detail, I urge you to apply this message to your life as well. We are living in this harsh, tough world. We are living with, alongside, fleshly people. And we have to stay awake so that we won't accept their worldly culture, spiritual. Otherwise, you are easily tainted by them. Father God told them not to have pity on them. Uh, some Some people may think, But it's not easy to keep our heart. We are living in the world, so we have to give out the aroma of Christ. But if we take in the worldly things, and we shouldn't be envious of the people taking in worldly things, we eat, we would turn into fleshly people. That's why Father God told us to look up to heaven and not to take the things of the earth. When the Israelites entered Canaan, God told them to annihilate the Canaanites. So you shouldn't be mistaken that Father God was cruel because people have a tendency to be tainted by evil so easily. We have to cut ourselves off the worldly only by doing so we can live in the light we shouldn't think this isn't a big deal it'll be okay to and we shouldn't compromise before you know it your passion cools down some people said when we you know after uh, she confessed that uh, during the prayer time they didn't come to the church but they you know we can eat out sometimes we can have joyful time with our family we can have a trip but if those things affects your spiritual life, we have to cut ourselves off of it. We shouldn't think, uh, it doesn't hurt, it'll be okay. These things themselves are not sins, but as they take up your heart, suppose the Israelites have pity on the Canaanites. Father God committed them to kill them, but, I mean, 
King Saul didn't disobeyed God's command and that's why he was forsaken. If you find yourself being envious of the worldly people, please apply this message to your own life and live according to God's will. people I mean as for those who haven't learned the situation in detail and involve fleshly thoughts they may see the conquest of Canaan as unjust they misunderstand that God took away the land from the Canaanites already living there gave it to Israel and commanded all of them to be killed But these conquest battles were not simply about God's blessing the Israelites and giving them the land. It was also His righteous judgment on the Canaanites drenched in sins and evil. In Genesis chapter 15 is a scene where God foretold Abraham that his offspring would enter Canaan. He promised to give that land. He said that Abraham's offspring, the Israelites, would live as slaves in a foreign land and return to Canaan. But the time hadn't arrived yet. And God explained the reason. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Reading the Bible, we often find a scene where God exercised His judgment when people in a specific area had become severely corrupt and drenched in iniquities. The reason is, if we had let them be so and not judge them, their iniquities would have spread all over the world like a pandemic and seriously interfered with His providence of the human cultivation. We have to keep this in mind. Since works like a pandemic, think about this. When we take one fleshly thing, we continually want to take more worldly things and sins spread among people. That's why God commanded them to kill all the Canaanites. That's what the world is like. That we have to realize this. That's why when people in a specific area became so drenched in sins and evil, when their sins reached a certain point, God couldn't help but judge them. We have to understand His His plan and providence. Thus, if people's iniquities reach a certain point, God cannot but judge them according to His justice. It's not that God is a scary and frightening God. God wants to gain true children. God wants to gain good grains. But just because sins spread, God has a plan of six, cultivate human beings for 6,000 years. Sodom and Gomorrah from Genesis also faced a judgment with fire and brimstone for having been drenched in sins and evil. As God sent one of His archangels to the city, and when the archangel went into the city, the people wanted to take her. They were so evil. They were so corrupted. That's how their sins were confirmed. We understand this because we heard the explanations from senior pastor. We know the spiritual meanings around the incident, but as we as we read the book about Abraham, we read detailed spiritual explanation about the incident. So. We are joyful to know the fact. We know that how corrupted they were through that incident. In the days of Noah, people faced the judgment for the same reason. They weren't people qualifying for salvation. 
That's why God judged them when their sins reached a certain point. The same went for Pompeii, a historically well-known city. Those who have been on pilgrimage trip must have seen the ruins of the city. One day in AD 79, Mount Vesuvius, located near Pompeii, erupted all of a sudden. Amidst the eruption, the citizens of Pompeii were engulfed. And the city that had been... It was completely buried under the ashes. Its remains excavated later testifying that the people were so corrupt from both religious and moral perspectives. Like those cities, the Canaanites were severely corrupt and soon to be judged. God judged the Canaanites by having His people, the Israelites, destroy them. But we should should never misunderstand God. God doesn't destroy people right away just because they are sinners deserving His judgment. God stays patient until their iniquities reach the intolerable point. In the book of Jonah, God proclaimed He would destroy Nineveh. But as all of His people, including the king himself and the animals, repented and fasted in ashes, how did God respond? He extended His mercy and forgiveness. For a long time, He gave many chances to the Canaanites as well. Even so, they didn't repent to the end, finally being destroyed by His judgment. Even while He was judging them, God set apart those who were good-hearted and feared them, and He allowed them to live in His mercy and favor. One of them was Uh, One of them was a harlot named Rahab who hid the Israelite spies. As Rahab heard about the works God manifested through Israel, she came to believe in and fear God, so he hid the spies from Israel. The spies promised to save Rahab and her family during the Israel's attack on Jericho, and they But they offered to do it under a condition. The condition was, I mean, when Rahab helped them escape through a window, she used a scarlet cord. Rahab had to tie the scarlet cord in the window. The Israelites, during the attacks on Jericho, Rahab had to tie that scarlet cord in the window and her family had to stay in the house marked with that scarlet cord. If they didn't do so, they couldn't be saved. That was the condition. It was an essential condition for them to be protected in such a chaotic battle. While the Israelites killed so many people, I mean, They were, while they were entering the city and killed so many people in the city, they couldn't check every person to see whether he or she was of Rahab's family. That's why they presented a condition. In a way, this was similar to the conditions to avoid the death of the firstborns during the Exodus. During the, I mean, the Israelites had conditions to follow to be protected from the plague of the death of the firstborn. God didn't protect them just because they were Israelites. God presented conditions, and if they kept it, God would protect them. The condition was. They had to apply the blood of the lamb on their doorposts and they were not to go outside. This carries spiritual principles on how the children of God can be protected from the worldly disasters. Nowadays, the world is drenched in sins and evil with thick darkness. As days go by, all kinds of disasters become more rampant. Countless people suffer from wars, famine, 
earthquakes, hurricanes, floods, diseases, and lose their lives. But those who believe in the Lord can be protected from the disasters by the work of the precious blood of the Lamb. The condition is to live in His precious blood. Namely, those who live in His precious blood, the Lord, the truth, and the Word of God are protected. No matter how many Despite many diseases and disasters out in the world, as long as we live in His boundary, we are protected, Father God says. Just as the Israelites applied the blood on their doorposts and didn't walk out the door, and Rahab's family stayed inside a house marked with the scarlet cord, we shouldn't befriend the world filled with sins and evil. Only then can can we be protected. The Bible says, the one who keeps His commandments abides in Him, and He in Him. We know by this that He abides in in us by the Spirit whom He has given us. As you dwell in the Lord and His precious blood, you abide in Him, and He in you. Therefore, you can always be protected. To paraphrase, no matter how many times you say, I believe you, Lord, unless you keep His commandments and abide in Him, God cannot protect you. Today, while people profess to believe in the Lord, so many of them suffer from all kinds of disasters, trials, and tribulations because they don't know this fact. If any of you are suffering from any trials, tribulations, or disasters, I urge you to keep the Word of God at least from now on. If you dwell in the light, God protects you from facing any disaster. I ask in our Lord's name that all of you will always enjoy His protection on account of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shed His blood for us. No matter what kind of trouble you have, no matter what kind of disease you have, and there is a condition, you know, you have to live in His precious blood and in the truth. That means we should have no wall of sin. It doesn't make sense if we, I mean, if we live in the truth, we cannot befriend the world. We You attend worship services. You attend prayer meetings. But out in the world, you quarrel with people. You complain. You cease to pray. If you do so, that doesn't mean you are living in His precious blood. You have to apply the blood of the Lamb on your doorposts and stay inside. But if you stay outside, you cannot be protected. We know about God's great power and we have to live in Him. We shouldn't go outside. We shouldn't let the enemy devil mess with us and bring us troubles and diseases. But God presents us with a solution. We have to repent and turn from our ways and live in His precious blood. I want all of you to live so. There is another startling incident in regard to the conquest of Canaan. After Joshua followed God's command and destroyed Jericho drenched in sins and evil, he declared with an oath that the city would never be rebuilt. The Bible says, Then Joshua made them take an oath at that time, saying, Cursed before the Lord is the man who rises up and builds the city Jericho, With the loss of his firstborn, he shall lay its foundation, and with the loss of his youngest son, he shall set up his gates. We can find how strictly God judged them for their iniquities. And 1 Kings 16, verse 34 confirms how the words of Joshua were fully guaranteed by God. In his days, Hill, the Bethelite, built Jericho. He laid its foundations with the loss of Abraham, his firstborn. Joshua 
obviously prophesied that the city wouldn't be rebuilt. And the Bible says, with the loss of Abraham his firstborn and set up its gates with the loss of his youngest son, s a g u b according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua and the son of Nun. This verse is about an incident which happened during King Ahab's reign about 500 years after Joshua's oath. This enlightens us on the fact that the words of the Lord's servant whom God is with are guaranteed. God never forgets the words of a servant whom He is with, but makes sure to guarantee them. After taking over Jericho, Israel advanced towards the city of Ai, their next target. After spying on the city, the spies suggested, Do not let all the people go up. Only about two or three thousand men need to go up to Ai. Do not make all the people toil up there, for there are few. Having conquered the impregnable city of Jericho so easily, they thought that taking Ai, which was smaller, was just a piece of cake. But here, the Israelites forgot something. They won victory. They won victory in Jericho not because they had outstanding power, but thanks to God's presence. Remembering this, they shouldn't have acted. They shouldn't have acted based on what they physically saw and based on man's thoughts. But they should have acted, discerning God's will first. It looked like they were strong enough to take over that small city of Ai on their own. According to the spies' suggestions, 3,000 men went up to attack the city but suffered a miserable defeat. Not only did they lose battle, but 36 of them died, which was really shocking. They were convinced that God would be with them and they would win victory for sure. But not being able to take that small city, they only had casualties. What could they do about this? This wasn't just a single defeat. The fact that God was not with them was a serious problem. So the Bible says, the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Because of this shocking defeat, Joshua tore his clothes, fell face down to the ground, and pleaded with God until evening along with the elders of Israel. How did God respond to this? What was wrong with these people of God? They conquered Jericho, but how come they suffered a miserable defeat by the small city of Ai? There was clearly a reason. People may think sometimes they win, sometimes other times they lose, but there was a clear spiritual reason. We will talk about this in detail in the next session. The Bible says, The horse is prepared for the day of battle, but victory belongs to the Lord. People may do this and that to prepare for a battle, but victory rests on God. We do need to make preparations with faith, but the outcome wholly depends on God. So we have to commit things to Him by faith. you shouldn't accept this word in your own way I mean knowing that God would fulfill His word anyway you shouldn't just sit back and do nothing God wants us to circumcise our heart pray fervently and please Him and try to do things in our life while we do so we have to wait for God to work for us. We have to lay the 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 assignment for us is to it is not to involve fleshly thoughts, but to obey unconditionally. Only then will God work for us. While committing things to God, we do nothing. It's not committing things to God. 
While the Almighty God was with Israel, they could take over the impregnable city of Jericho instantly. But without Him, they failed to take over even a small city of Ai. This wasn't just the case in Israel's history. This principle applies to all affairs of our lives today. No matter how difficult our problem, God can make things God can make anything possible. What problems do you have? What goals do you have? I urge you to commit things to God only and be provided with His strength. To commit things to God is to come forth with the heart of God. To come forth with the heart of God, it is to cast off darkness, and, but suppose you don't circumcise your heart and say, God, please help me. I have these difficulties. If so, if you don't cast off sins, if you don't destroy the wall of sin, if you don't admit your wall of sin and repent thoroughly, you cannot enjoy His help. God can do everything, but He does not listen to a sinner. He does not answer a prayer from a sinner. That's why the city, the Israelites lost the battle in the city of Ai. No matter how many times you say, I believe in your great power, but if God doesn't give you spiritual faith, it's because you live in darkness. We know this well through the lectures on the first John. People who live those who love their brothers is the children of God if we don't love others we are the sons of the enemy devil God says God does not give strength to people who are sons of the enemy so you have to find out the reason why you are not helped by God why you continually repeatedly suffer trials you have to discover the original reason and change your spiritual life. I urge you to discern God's will by always hearing clear voice of the Holy Spirit and His guidance, not insisting on man's thoughts and ways. If only you obey, you, if only you obey your will, His will, your problems will be resolved. How to hear clearly His voice? We have to pray fervently. Some of you may not pray. Some of you may find it difficult to pray in your homes. You have to break that fleshly thoughts. You have to pray with the hope to bring down God's power even at your homes. You may say, I cannot go to church. I cannot pray well. But we have no choice. Amidst the pandemic, we have to pray at our homes. How did Daniel pray? Even when you pray at your homes, you can pray with the GCN on. How thankful we should be that we can pray. And how thankful we should be that Mrs. Bong Yim Lee holds on to that. We have to, so we have to devote ourselves to prayer. But if you keep complaining, please don't say, it's difficult to pray alone at our homes. Don't say that. But you have to give thanks for as you pray, you can confess, Father God, I'm praying. Please provide me with strength. And you have to bring down His power. You have to know that God listens to your prayer and listens to your cry for help. We have to pray fervently like this and hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. And whatever situation you may face, you should... Some people say, I want to know... when you have concerns and worries, you can pray and drive them out and you can confess, by God, I can do everything. You can just 
That's how you obey the voice of the Holy Spirit. Then the Holy Spirit will guide you every step of the way. So you have to stay awake in prayer and follow the Holy Spirit's guidance by clearly hearing His voice. As you If only you obey His will, your problems will be resolved and your heart's wish will be fulfilled, just as the thick wall of Jericho crumbled down instantly. This applies to resolving our church issues as well as our own problems. When we set a course of the church on a big scale for the fulfillment of God's providence, or when we make decisions for our personal matters, If we always hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and obey, God takes responsibility for the outcome. We are now trying to set a course of the church on a big scale. For example, we are trying to move into a new sanctuary. We have to We know that we will accomplish the construction of the Grand Sanctuary, but before that, actually, for, as for me, I didn't want to move into a new sanctuary while Sina Pastor is not here with us. We want to, I wanted to start over with, with Sina Pastor, but, but now we are in a position to move into a new sanctuary. And as we pray, I realize that Father God wants us to set our foot into Jordan. He is telling us to march around the city. When we were in the space of the shepherd, everything prospered. Sina Pastor did everything, and there was nothing we did. But, I mean, but now, nowadays, including me, the church workers are. holding on to God with prayer. I know that all the church members are doing the same, and we have to act by faith. Uh, when we move into a new sanctuary, we may move, we may, the sanctuary may be smaller than this. We may be in a different place. But if you complain, we shouldn't complain, but we have to discover God's will and give thanks. It's not that we are still... Even if we find ourselves in a trial, if we give thanks, we have to... We are now having a time of uniting as one. We have to... We are trying to make a new lip even though we may not know God's will once we pray with faith God will present us with the way and guide us I thank the church church workers for obeying by faith I also ask all the church members to have positive thinking and have spiritual thoughts and make confession of faith and discover God's will. But for you may face critical moments, crucial moments for, for you to hear the voice of the Spirit. The secret, secret is the prayer and fasting. When, especially when we set a course of the church on a big scale, the church workers should offer fasting and prayer. I think the church workers, for doing so, what God wants us to do is to set we have to find out what we have to do We have to have this spiritual awakening. Father God is Almighty and it is our Father, and He solves our problems. I hope that you can all march by faith. 
So what you have to do is discern God's will and obey. I pray in our Lord's name that the Almighty God directly intervenes in your spiritual battles and always give you victory until the day you enter New Jerusalem. Hallelujah! Almighty Father God of love, please lay your hands on all brothers and sisters receiving this prayer here in attendance. Lay your hands on all the members of the brain churches and local centuries, and all the GCN TV viewers, and those who are watching via satellites, cables, and internet all over the world, transcending space and time. Plant faith in their hearts and drive out their negative thoughts and doubts. Let all the trials and afflictions leave them. By the fire of the Holy Spirit, from head to toe, scorch their sick and affected parts, including all cells, tissues and nerves, all internal organs and intestines. Let the light of creation come upon them. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command the enemy devil and Satan, all diseases, germs and viruses, and infirmities, go away. Let the light shine on them. Scorch their incurable and long-term diseases by the fire of the Holy Spirit. Burn all kinds of endemic and contagious diseases like malaria. Be cleansed and made well. All epidemic diseases such as colds and fever go away from them. Protect them from any kinds of germs and viruses and bacteria. Heal them of all kinds of cancers like stomach cancer, lung cancer, liver cancer, breast cancer, womb cancer, intestinal cancer, and all other diseases like AIDS, leukemia, cerebral apoplexy, high blood pressure, low blood pressure, heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, women's diseases, thyroid diseases, and all inflammations. Let them be made whole from polio, stroke, arthritis, herniated discs, and many others. Let all kinds of pains disappear from them, like back pain, headache, and neuralgia. Set them free from epilepsy, autism, depression, neurosis, and all other mental diseases. Loosen them from all kinds of paralysis, and let them get up, walk, and jump. Let them regain good eyesight and restore good hearing. Let the blind open their eyes and the deaf come to hear and mute begin to speak. Heal them of after effects of all kinds of accidents. Restore their ruptured and broken bones. Restore them from burns and let the heat and burning sensation go away from them. Father, let there be no scars left. Be cleansed from all kinds of drug addictions and poisoning. Father, regenerate dead nerves, tissues and cells and bring the dead back to life. Father, please bless them to conceive a baby. Bless them to conceive a baby. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command the enemy devil and Satan, the ruler of the air, the evil forces and their servants, go away from them. Go away, you evil spirits, unclean spirits, deceiving spirits, spirits of falsehood, separating spirits and all forces of darkness. Loosen all bonds of wickedness and darkness and go away from them. Let the light shine on them. Father God, give them strength to cry out in their prayer and empower them with the power to cast off sins and become sanctified. Let them be in good health as their soul becomes prosperous and let their family be evangelized. Protect them from all kinds of accidents and disasters and bless them to lead a successful and prosperous life in everything. Please protect your children, their home, their business and their work by the fiery hedge of the Holy Spirit, with the heavenly host and angels, and with your blazing eyes. Give students wisdom and understanding and fill their hearts with more passion and desire for study. Keep their hearts and minds from worldly things and plant into their hearts more fervent love for God. Bless your children and let them give glory to you in everything they do, whether they eat or drink or whatever they do. Let them confess and testify to the living God, I've met God, I've experienced God, and received His answers and blessings. Father God, thank you. Let all glory be to you alone. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.